Good morning. You know, you got so much talent around here. It's unbelievable. I love to see preachers when they get the microphone. Oh, boy. No, it's great. Everybody here is so, I mean, it's just wonderful. Uh, it's, I have the honor and the privilege of bringing the word to you this morning. So I only speak when I'm called upon. Hallelujah. Back in the days, I did the calling. Now I'm waiting for the call. No, it's just, it's just, it's a God thing, you know. Somebody say it's a God thing. It's just a God thing, man. You got to do what God says to do, and that's all you can do. But it's wonderful. But I, I appreciate so much uh, the anointing that's in this place. Is uh, it's, it's anointing's always been. I'll re, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind that just a moment. The anointing's not in the place. It's not in this building or any building. The anointing's in you. And we're going to major on that a little bit. But I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited about, you know, God's word and what God's doing. I'm, I'm also, you know, we, we, we pray for Israel. We should always pray for Israel. Um, but I, I love what you, what you prayed, um, my wonderful daughter. I like, she's, a, she's cut off the old blocks. Part of me, part of her, and we don't know what we got left, but there you go. She, she's awesome. But uh, what you prayed, you know, that it's not just about Israel. It's about the nations involved. And the, the poor people that literally are drug into this thing, that had no concept of what's going on. It's always a few at the top. You know, the people that, uh, that want to run the world, always been here and they'll always be here. But those people are the ones that seems like they want to pull everybody into their, their problem. And the truth of it is, a lot of innocent people out there, all over the nation, all over the world. And so we don't want to forget the other people as well, because we're not, we don't pray for Israel because, wow, let's pray for Israel. Yay, Israel. No, we love Israel. God loves Israel. We get that. God also has a church called the church that Jesus said he would build. And so he's building his church, and his church can be found, guess where? Israel, Iran, Iraq. Are you all here? His, his, his people are everywhere. And so we don't want to forget anybody when you pray. Amen? Amen. The Bible says we're peacemakers. That's what we do. And uh, so we want to pray for peace that, uh, for everywhere we go for sure. Uh, I was going through a couple of things here. I'm going to pick up where I left off, I don't know, several weeks ago, whatever it was, uh, on Door to the Supernatural. I want to go deeper into that. I was cheated out of a few minutes last time <laughs> because my daughter... She played a game with me. I was watching the clock. I was trying to be obedient. I thought, it can't be that time, but it must be that time. My eyes, and I can't see that one, but I thought, well, it's got to be right. So this time I told, yeah, this time I told, I told Titus back there, Titus, what clock do you have me on? He says, the regular clock. And I said, I love Titus because he picked it up last time when I said that. So he went right to the regular. So I got the regular clock going. I will not be cheated. I will not be cheated. I don't care how long you guys take offerings. I don't care how long that you pray at the altar. I don't care how long. I'm doing my thing today, okay? I'm just playing with y'all. I appreciate the flow of the service, and I know some great things happen. Every time we come to the altar, great things happen. They always do. So very exciting. Hallelujah. I was reading, actually, I was just going through some stuff, and I was flip, at my desk. I was flipping through the computer. And uh, this popped up, and I thought, oh, that's, a, that's an odd-looking picture. And I pulled it up, and I thought, oh, wow, I never heard of it before. But it's, I'll, I'll probably murder this, but it says Kuilash Temple. Anybody ever heard of that? Kuilash Temple? Well, forget that then, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's a temple that's uh, in India. And uh, it's, it's a stone mountain, solid stone. And they literally went in and cut out into this stone mountain a temple called Kuilash. And it's the largest rock-cut Hindu temple in the world. And it, it's really amazing to look at it. And it was built to worship God, even though it's not the Hindu God's not God, not our God, the God of the Bible. Uh, but yet they, they built this thing to worship God. And I was, I was, as I was scrolling through, I saw one of the Ethiopian church 
that was carved out of stone just like that. They found a mountain. They carved it out of stone. An Ethiopian church is really interesting. And I, I take it for granted it's probably in Ethiopia. That would make sense. But, but uh, they built it to worship God. And then I started scrolling, and there's all kinds of them. They're, they're all over the world that these, these people have went in and hewn out of solid rock. They've hewn these places of worship where they worship God. Now, whether he's the real God to them or not, I don't know. But here's what stuck in my mind, because I want to go in this a little bit deeper today. But man always takes something that God created, and he makes God a house out of it. Think about that. Man always does that. But then I had a thought. God takes something that he created, and he makes it the house of God. Now, think about that. So we are the people of God. I want to major on this, Door of the Supernatural, because, you know, the song you were singing, this one song you were singing, guys, are, they're, they're right on the money and all of that. And, and uh, my daughter, she, she got up here. She gets in the Holy Ghost, and sometimes, uh, you know, I don't, I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. I don't know if I'm going to be able to preach or not. She's going she's gonna to get up here and just preach the house down. It's going to be over in 15 minutes, and that'll be in it. But you know what she did? She started, she started doing that. She, just got, she got going there, and she said, you got to understand, we're supernatural people. <laughs> I looked at my wife. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, here we go. That's that anointing, man. You get around it. You just can't get away from it. But anyway, she was picking up on that, too. She had no idea what I'm speaking on. And so I said, there it goes. It's supernatural. So we want to talk about that. I, how many come to, to get into your Bible? They always have to ask us, how many come to get into your phone <laughs> or whatever device you have, right? Well, whatever it is is okay with me. I don't really care one or the other, but uh, as long as it's the Word of God, that's the most important thing. Uh, but uh, I, I want to get into this where I left off last time. I, I was getting to this one major point I was going to make, and I looked up and saw the clock and said, oh, no, because if I get into that point, I'll never, I'll never finish it anyway. So I want to come back to that. Because I believe it's where the Lord wants us to be this morning. So, the supernatural is God's divine nature. It is who he is. You cannot read the Bible and not see that God is supernatural. He's nothing like us, his creation. He is way beyond us. And his nature is divine, but it's supernatural. And also, you can't read the Bible without seeing uh, the power of God. So the supernatural of God, who he is, his essence of who he is, and his power, when they come together, they create things. And so this is an amazing thought when you just sit and meditate on that alone. And I believe with all of my heart as we go through this, you're going to see that that divine nature of God which is supernatural, and that supernatural part of God, which is the power of God. When they unite together, it really brings heaven into the earth, or it, it invades the earth. And he's invading the earth, not with just his uh, divine influence or his power. He, devades, he, de uh, he, he invades the earth through his people. we got to start thinking differently. we got to start seeing ourselves a little bit differently. So we're going to get into the Word of God. I have a lot of Scripture for you. We're going to read a lot of it. Some I'll make some comments on. But I just, I love doing it this way because it gets you into your Bible and you'll understand that it's right there in your Word. And I want you to see it. So God's supernatural, right? So if God's supernatural, then Christianity has to be supernatural. Otherwise, we're no different than any other religion on earth. And God is supernatural. That would make His Son, Jesus, supernatural. The Holy Ghost of God, we're going to talk about, he also is supernatural, nothing natural about him. The Bible, this book that I have in the pulpit today is supernatural. You cannot read it to gain knowledge. You read it to gain the heart of God and the thoughts of God as you read it. And then that makes prayer supernatural, which means that prayer can be very, very boring. It could be tedious. It could be 
Like, you know, prayer, nobody wants to do prayer. Not really. I'm, well, intercessors do. But most people in general don't want to do prayer. They just don't want to because it comes against everything that we warfare on planet Earth. But when you see prayer as supernatural, what you can say in 10 words can change the course of your life or somebody's life that you're interceding for. Not a lot of speaking. Jesus said, you, you think you're heard for all the talking you're doing. You're not heard for the talking you're doing. Now, listen very carefully. So a prayer then, then that means we have to get a mindset that becomes supernatural, and we have to talk about the power of God because there's no way we can get it done without the power of God. We just can't do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, the first scripture of this morning. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's, say it, power. power. Say it again. So it's not your talking that gets the attention of God. It's the power. People don't care how much you know. They don't even care how much you care. I've heard all those, all those slogans. None of that matters. What matters is that what you say carries with it a power that is really an authority behind it. Very, very critical. So there's a power of God in the kingdom. It's not just talking. It's something you can see tangible happening all around us. I think that's where the church has missed it. We'll get to this point in just a moment. Luke 24 and 49, look what it says. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Several things here. So that word endued, it means clothed or infused with. It also means filled with. So Jesus said, look, guys, I've taught you everything I know. They had this incredible knowledge for three years with Jesus. How many would like three minutes with the Word of God? Yes. Just three, I mean three minutes. Three years they sat 24-7 listening to the Word of God himself speaking into their world. We don't even know everything he said. If you think the Gospels is all he said, we're sadly mistaken. There's all kinds of things he put into them for three years. It's amazing what they heard, what they saw, what they listened to. Now, Jesus is saying this. Listen, I've given you all the knowledge I have, but I want you to go to Jerusalem and don't do anything. I don't want you to do a thing. I don't want you to preach a sermon. I don't want you to do anything whatsoever. By the way, they've already been out healing sick and casting out devils. They've already been doing that for three years. But Jesus said, now that I'm leaving, I want you to go into Jerusalem Go to the upper room and stay there and don't move until you become clothed with power. You have to be clothed with power. This is where the church is missing it. I mean, we are missing it so badly, it's almost unbelievable. But here we are. Jesus said it's so important that you don't do that because I'm sending you the promise I talked to you about. They didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. I want to send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait until he comes. And you will be endued with power from where? On high. We're not talking about in the sky. We're talking about from heaven. Jesus even told the disciples, he said, this is how you're going to pray from now on. Because they said, teach us how to pray because, Lord, you spend a lot of time in prayer. Tell us how to do that. You always come back so enriched and so excited and so enthused, you know, and so full of joy. Teach us how to do that. And Jesus said, oh, that's easy. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Oh, here it is. Thy kingdom come on earth just like it is in heaven. The church of Jesus Christ would rather sit around and argue about, well, is that kingdom theology? And I don't know if I believe in kingdom theology. Maybe we should believe in the love boat, and maybe we should believe in the grace movement. And whatever, whatever movement's popping up, we'll believe in that movement or the miracle movement or the prophetic movement. We all jump in all kinds of movements when the Bible's very, very clear. Jesus said, look, you wait until you get power, and when you get power, you're going to be so clothed that you're going to understand what this power is all about because it comes from heaven. And my kingdom I want on earth just like I have it in heaven. Yes. Somebody's not hearing this this morning. Are you? This is the word of the Lord. I want you to listen very carefully. This has been bottled up in me for several weeks now. So listen 
Listen very, 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 very carefully to God's word. So we have this incredible infusion of the power of God. I looked this up. When I looked this up, this is this amazing, this clothed, you know. I looked that up, and it literally says, if you look it up, it's like the soul that is clothed with the body. That's where that word comes from. So it's like your soul, which is on the inside of your body that you cannot see. You cannot see it, but it's there. How do we know you have a soul? When you die, your body falls over and your soul will leave. Spirit, you'll leave. So we know your soul is in your body. That's what this is talking about. You are, you are to wait until the Spirit of God clothes you. He covers you. He embraces you. He fills you. He endues you. He gives you power that you've never known before. And it's not coming to an altar to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues and go back to your seat and then go back out on Monday and begin to live whatever, however you want to live. You, that's not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost enclose you. He fills you. He endues you. And in, and he fills you with this incredible power to do something. And that power comes from God. It comes from heaven. It's dunamis. It's the word dunamis. Now, we all know that. It's dynamite power. But it's really another phrase that goes better with that. It's not about the explosiveness of it. It's about the achieving power. God says, I want you to achieve something. I didn't give you this to give you goosebumps. I didn't give you this to make you feel better about yourself. I didn't give you this so you can go to some Pentecostal church and get lost in the crowd speaking in other tongues. That's not what this is about. This is about in the power that you get from God on high. He comes inside you, clothes you with it, and gives you this achieving ability to do whatever he's called you to do. I will achieve my goal because I'm clothed with the power of God. Filled with God's power. I'll see we're not going to finish this, Pastor Bart. It's the achieving power. So then if the church is not achieving, then we're not clothed with power. But I spoke in tongues in 1936. I remember that day very clear. I remember my day too, April 26, 1975. I remember that day. I, I remember that day. My wife and I were filled with the Holy Ghost, and we spoke in other tongues. And I mean, God moved, and, but we felt something different that shifted in our life. And all of a sudden, I realized Wait a minute here. There might be some things I can do for God. Just maybe I got a little bit of an anointing. Maybe there's some power. Now, I'm, I'm going to show this right here. I'm going to show it later. I'm going to show it right here, okay? I got a little Bible here, pocket Bible. I bought it 50 years ago. It's an expensive little Bible. You can see it's like brand new still. Inside of it, I have scriptures. I have scriptures written down. On the back side of it, I have scriptures. A page in, I, I put this down. What you say brings things to pass. I was saved one month when I wrote that in there. This is the reason Christians are not maturing today. That's why they can't come back Sunday after Sunday. You had to go, where'd they go this time? What sin they fighting now? Ain't you got no power? Nobody likes that kind of preaching because they don't like to step on your burning bush. I get that. But the truth of it is, I wrote this when I was a baby, but I, I got it, and the revelation got in me, and then I began to feel the power percolating, and I thought, if they did it then, why can't I do it now? I was so ignorant to the things of the world that I wanted God so bad that I wrote this down. What you say will bring things to pass. That's pretty simple. Speak in agreement with God. Doesn't take a genius to do that. See it spiritually, then you'll see it physically. Watch this. This is 50-some years ago. Satan has no authority, only deception. What are you worried about the devil? Oh, my God, is this the end of the world? The rapture didn't happen when it was supposed to happen a few days ago because the sun got in front of the moon or whatever. And whatever, whatever it, yeah, the moon got in front of the sun. Okay. See, I don't even care. But somebody got in front of somebody. And when that happened, oh, my God, it was all over the Internet. Oh, the rapture. You'd be like a bunch of fools now, don't you? 
Not you all. I'm talking about the people on the Internet. I read this stuff, and I'm thinking, dear Lord, have they ever cracked their Bible even one time? But here, I'm a baby Christian. Now watch. Wondering is wavering. Keep faith applied until you have the results. Oh, we just give, we give up. We whine and cry about everything. Thank you. Faith has no deadline. When's it going to happen? It's going to happen. Fearless confidence in God's word does not fail. And then a couple more, just very quickly. This is, this, is, this, is, this is stuff you can preach on if you want to. Faith and patience go together. Oh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want no patience. I like faith. I don't want no patience. Then you better forget faith because it, it's all about patience. There's no middle ground in God's faith. Here, Pastor Barb, take a look at that and then pass it down the front row. We'll just, just pass it down the front row and let them just look at that for a second. Just let them look at it for a second. Now, when you touch it, you may get burned. It's okay. <laughs> we'll get you healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. We all here this morning? Yeah. All right. So the promise comes from the Father, from above, upon the people of God to do, do them or give them achieving power so when they do something, it will actually happen. And it comes from God, right? It's like your soul is clothed with your flesh, so the Spirit of God clothes you with himself. That is amazing. That's amazing. If your mind can renew to that thought alone, you will never be the same ever again. I promise you that. All right? Now, this was the last words of Jesus according to Luke, by Luke's account. The last phrase that Jesus made was Luke 24, 49. That's the last phrase. The instruction he gave at the very end of his life, this is what I want you to do. So don't go off half-cocked looking for something to do for God until you get some power on you. And, and watch this. Because everybody, listen, I've seen this, I've, oh, my gosh, thousands of people come through our ministry all over the years, and I've see, I can see you. I can see you when you walk in the room. I wish I didn't have this gift. I honest to God, I wish I didn't have it. It's called discernment, and I have a very, very strong one. When I walk in the room, I can sense somebody way over in the middle of uh, there. I could, maybe I'm pointing at you now. I don't know. But I can sense it. Something's wrong. Something's off. And I pick it up. And it always turns out they want to do their own thing. I do it better than the pastor does it. I do it better than so does. I'm above my teacher now. I can do what I want to do because I'm a, I know this stuff now. I can go out on my own and do it now. You are destined to fail because you don't understand that the power comes from him on you to envelop you, to clothe you just like your soul and your body. They, you cannot separate the two. And you'll go out and you hurt yourself and you hurt everybody around you and you wonder what happened in your life? Because it will happen eventually. You'll fail. You'll fall. And hopefully someone's there that has maturity to pull you back and get you propped up again. And we will always be there for you, obviously. So hear that. What do I want to do here, Lord? Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive. There it is. But you shall receive achieving power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, you shall receive achieving power, and then you'll be a witness to me. Now watch that. Not a witness for me. It's a witness to me. Huge difference. I'm going to go out in the streets, and I'm going to win people to Jesus. I'm going to witness for Jesus. Jesus don't need your witnessing for he needs you witnessing to. Witnessing to what? Witnessing to him. Who is him? Who is he? John chapter 1. He's the word that was in the beginning with God. That's a revelation John got. He was in the beginning with God. 
and he was God. Think about that. Now, when you understand that Jesus is the word, he is the living word of God, then I receive power to achieve when the Holy Spirit comes upon me so I can be a witness to him. The word witness there is the word martus or the word martyr. There's nobody in this room or within the sound of my voice that would say, Jesus, I cannot wait to be a martyr. <laughs> there are those that are called to be martyrs. You better thank God he hasn't called you to do that. You probably wouldn't be living in America anyway because you're not going to die for Jesus here like that. That's not going to happen here. You say, well, I know people who have, but that's not martyr. Listen very carefully. The word is martyr. Does that mean I will have to die? Let's read it again. But you shall receive achieving power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs to me. Do you have to die? No. It means you will have to die to yourself and to the word of the living God. To me. Jesus, me, the word. So you got to die to the word. What does, that, what does that mean? That means I have no opinion about what the Bible says. You can't ask me, what do I think about that? I don't think anything about the Bible. I just read it, and God reveals it, and I hopefully that I can grab it and use the power of it to achieve something while I'm on this earth. That becomes a martyr to him. I, may, I won't have to give my flesh, probably. That's probably not going to happen to anybody in this room. I'm sure of it. You're not going to die because you preach Jesus Christ. Not in America. It's not going to happen. It happens in other parts of the world, for sure. But not here. Thank God it doesn't happen here. But that's not what that scripture is saying. It's saying, listen, if you want to really have the power of God to operate, to be enclosed with it, to have achieving power, when you walk into a room, somebody says, oh, my God, what happened? The atmosphere is different here. What's going on here? What, what is this all about? I had a prophecy on me. I've had lots and lots and lots of prophecies over the years. I was a very young Christian and uh, very young, and I walked into a room with a well-known uh, prophetic guy, and I was very young, and I think he's gone to be with the Lord. Maybe not. He might still be around. But he said to me, he says, young man, stand up. And I says, oh, boy. So I stood up. I'm like shaking. What's going on? I'm, I'm standing in the back, and he says, when you walk into this room, there was something on you, and from now on, whenever you walk into a room, the devil is going to know you're there. Because there will be something on you that, will, you, that, the, that the light will be a, attracted to it and the dark will become darker. Now, that was a powerful word. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. But I started to realize when I got my little Bible, and I said, I can do this. The Bible says I can do this. I went down to my basement, put that little Bible on the table, looked at it and says, God, if you did it for them, you can do it for me. And my little basement was a dingy old nasty basement you wouldn't want to be in. And I'm sitting at that little card table. I have the one chair, and I'm speaking in tongues, and I'm going through the Bible, and I'm saying, oh, God, just use me, use me, use me, use me, use me. And all of a sudden, this, this revelation came to me, and I thought, I can do this. I can do this. And so I grabbed my Bible, and I went to a hospital. There just ain't nobody to witness to. Go to a hospital. Everybody there is looking and waiting for you. I've only been thrown out of a hospital one time. Well, actually, I wasn't thrown out. Uh, I was asked to leave by the guy who was in the room. This is a terrible story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I walk into a room, have my Bible hidden, because you walk in with a big old arm Bible, they're going to say, oh, my God, you know, lunatics here. So I'd hide it, all my stuff, my little notes. And I walk into a room, and uh, this guy was in bed, and he was a young guy in his 20s. He had shot himself accidentally, and he's paralyzed from the neck down, could not move. And I, I felt bad for him. I said, I went through this whole thing. With him. First of all, I said, can I pray for you? He said, no. 
I can't pray for you, and that's the only time I've ever been denied one time out of I don't know how many times. One time. No, you can't. Well, I just want to pray for you. I want to see if God will touch you. Let me share the scripture. I don't want to know. Don't want to hear it. I want you out of my room. And I was at home. I looked around. I thought, who's going to make me? I know that's a horrible story. It's a terrible story. It's horrible. Hold on a minute. There I go again, drop a water roll. So I said I I said to him, I'm gonna pray for you. You're not gonna pray for me. I want you out of here. He starts yelling. I just shut the door. I went over to him. He can't stop me. So I laid my hands on him. He's screaming. I know it's a demon's all it was. Why? Because I was achieving something. Long, long story short, we prayed for him. I had a friend of mine with me too, by the way, my buddy. And we prayed for him, and God began to move on this guy. A couple days later, he starts moving his toes. Now, long story short, God touched this guy who had no hope whatsoever. And guess what? You come to Jesus. Come to Jesus' moment when God begins to move. Why? Achieving power. When God wants to do something with you, you have to get a revelation of this achieving power. If you go timid, you'll not see these things happen. You've got to be bold as a lion, gentle as a dove. Strong and mighty in the power of God. Church, every one of you. I was a child in Christ, a baby, an infant. Wrote a few things down. I said, I think, we can, I think this will happen. And we went and it began to happen. I could sit up here all day and tell you about all kinds of miracles. And some of you guys can too. But I'm telling you, God wants you to understand this thing is supernatural. This is way beyond what we believe that it is. Amen? So die to yourself Die to what you think the Bible says and begin to believe God for the supernatural. Amen? Amen. Supernatural power is what we're talking about. How do I get through that door? And this is where I stopped last time, right here. Supernatural power. Somebody said the other day, I can't wait till revival hits. And, and I, know what they're, I know what they're saying. I get it. And I... And I've done the same thing. I'm, I'm waiting for truth of it is, that's not even in the Bible. Hmm. Jesus never rescinded his last words, go. So supernaturals never stop. Powers never stop. The anointings never stopped. The church has been clothed since the book of Acts with the Holy Spirit. He's certainly willing. The Father is certainly willing because he sent his only son to purchase all of this for us. So the debt's been paid. It's finished. He was put into a grave so they could get rid of him. Lo and behold, God raised him from the dead just like he said he would. He comes out of the grave. He spends 40 days and 40 nights with the disciples again. Several people, actually. 40 days and 40 nights. We know nothing of what he said for 40 days and 40 nights. How many would like to know what the Word of God said? We have to. We only get this now by being clothed with the Word. And when you get that and begin to step out of faith, you'll begin to see things happen. You'll see revelation of what it is. So the supernatural's never stopped. Well, what happened? I mean, what, what happened? If it never stopped, why aren't we seeing it? The very question that we just ask is why aren't we seeing it already tells us why we're not seeing it. Because we don't believe it. Because if we believed it, we would see it. Jesus said if you can believe it, you will see it. If you can say it, you will get it. If you will knock, it'll be opened. Is anybody in the house today? 
You see, we're, God, where are you? God, where are you? This is the end time. God, don't you know this is the end times? God, you're leaving us here helpless. What are you doing, God? Do you know? Do you know we can't make it anymore, Lord? Do you know the economy is completely falling apart? Do you understand what's going on? God, do you know what's happening? You say, well, I wouldn't say that to God. No, but you do by your actions. I, you know, whatever. What happened? Who stopped it? If he didn't stop it, and there's nowhere in Scripture he did, nowhere, Holy Ghost is still here. I know he's in me. Is he in you? Do you speak in tongues? You need to do that and more. Have you ever laid hands on somebody lately? Oh, about three of them. That ball just fell off the table. It's going to clink. Are you all here? Well, why aren't you? Hospitals are full of them. We're so busy thinking about taking a jab, a shot, that we forgot about who we were. The devil set us back years in 2020 with a spirit of fear that gripped the church so badly that I'm staying home, man, I ain't going anywhere near those Christians. Those, those Christians are endued with power. Those Christians are filled with the power of God. Those Christians walk in faith. Those Christians can walk on water. Those Christians can raise the dead. They can heal the sick. They can cleanse the lepers. Those Christians are the ones you need to be around, not separated from. The devil did a really, really good job. But we're coming back. Come on, we're coming back. Fear is never God. Fear is never God. I'll say it again. Fear is never God. It's faith, 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 faith. That's what moves the hand of God. Fear will never move the hand of God because God's not moving. You are supposed to move. You are supposed to heal the sick. You are supposed to cleanse the lepers. You are supposed to take this gospel of the kingdom around the world as a witness to all nations before the end come. We're worried about the end coming. We bring about the end by our preaching of the kingdom of God. And I can prove it. I can prove it. I can prove it. Some people are going to say, I ain't going back to that church no more. <laughs> I met a young, nice, nice young know, family. I just met a wonderful family for service, and I didn't know who they were because I hadn't been there for a while. So I just went, I said, are you new? Yeah. And I introduced myself, introduced himself, and I said, hey, I'm preaching today, too. She's letting me preach today. And he said, you got a good sermon for me? That's what he said. <laughs> so help me. You got a good sermon? I said, yes, I do. I said, I'm a little radical. That's what I told him. I'm a little radical. He said, I like it. I like radical. Yeah. Are you all here? Yeah. People want the word. They don't care what you think about the word. I have become a martyr to the word a long time ago. I don't care what people think about it. It don't matter to me what people think about me or anything else or what I do. I am only dead to myself and dead to the what I think the word says. Whatever the word says, the word is, and that's the way it is. If you don't like it, take it up with him. Appreciate those three people standing and cheering for God. I'll preach another hour. I'll have you all on your feet. <sighs> what happened? What happened? This whole thing is leading up to this moment right now. What happened? What happened is very simple. It's not complicated. It's very simple. And that is preachers... Stop preaching it. Preachers rule in the kingdom. They do. Jesus is not coming up here and preaching a sermon for you. He's not going to do that. He finished his assignment. He did what he was supposed to do. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. He said, it's finished. They killed him. They put him in the grave. He came out of the grave. 
taught some more stuff. So guys, what I'm about to teach you now is really private stuff. It's for those who understand the endowment of power from on high. And don't you dare go out and do anything. Don't do a thing until you get this. Because when you get this, it's going to change the world. This will change the world. This will change the world. Preachers loved it. Peter loved it. He said, oh, I found something I can't believe. It. The denier of Jesus. The denier, the weakling, the big mouth, the cursor, the bad dude. He's just nonchalantly walking on a sunny day after coming out of prayer, and folks are getting out of wheelchairs, and they're rising to their feet, healed by the power of God. And the Bible says he didn't have a clue what was even going on. No knowledge there, just the power of God being endued with that anointing. He couldn't stop it if he tried. He walked on water, but it didn't phase him, didn't move him one bit. And all of a sudden, he gets this power. Oh, I'm endued. Something's going on here. I'm a dude that's in dude. I just got that from the Holy Ghost. Put that down. Somebody write a book about that. I'm a dude that's in dude. Or you can be a dudette. But you can't be a dude and be a dudette. And you can't be a dudette and be a dude. I'm a little ahead of my sermon there. I'm going to get to that, by the way, someday, if my daughter ever has me back again. <laughs> Y'all pray. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Preachers stopped it. They stopped it. Preachers are going to get what they preach. You preach healing, you're going to get people healed. You preach salvation, they'll get saved. Preachers get what they preach. The most important position, now this is going to, this is going to uh, I'm not going to quarrel with you over it, but I think the most important position in the church is the pastors. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'm not one now, but I'm going to tell you why. Because what they have this incredible responsibility Stand up here and stand before God someday, making sure that they give you the word of the living God. That they have become dead to themselves. Preachers stopped preaching this because they wanted a crowd for their ego. They wanted more money for their lifestyle. Need I go on? Thank you. Preacher stopped it. If preacher stopped it, they have to, they're the only ones that can unstop it. That's why I call this a very important position. Prophets are, are, are important. They're getting a lot of airtime now, and I think it's wonderful because I believe in them. I believe these guys, I believe this is the hour, man. I believe they're speaking the word of the living God. I believe that, but they're trying to wake the church up. Their church is so asleep. They're so lethargic. They're so like, what? You know, they just get off of your duff and do something for God. Dare to believe that if I pray for someone, they just might get healed. Well, I guarantee you, if you don't, they won't. Yeah. Pastors got to preach the word. Stop all this nonsense we call the word. I have no opinion on it. It's what God's word says. That's it. Someone once said many, many years ago, God's word said, says it, that settles it, and I believe it. No, no, no. God's word says it, that settles it. I don't care what you believe. It's forever settled. You're going to add to that. You have no opinion. I'm a martyr. And you're a martyr. This is good preaching. I don't need your applause. Look, no, no, I'm kidding you. I'm kidding I'm kidding I'm kidding I'm kidding. My flesh may like it, but it has nothing to do with the Word of God. Right? right? Nothing whatsoever. Preachers stopped it. When preachers stopped it, 
it was over. Because only preachers can get it back. So we're going to get together and pray, pray, pray for revival. Oh, hold on a minute. Let's just hold on. Let's, can we stay true to the word? Yes. Can we honestly? Yes. I'm a martyr. You want to be a martyr to the word? I am. Martyr to him, to him, to him. He's the word. If I'm a martyr to the word, I don't care what anybody thinks. So do we pray for revival? Where, where is that? I'm, I'll do it, but where is it? Where is it? I mean, it should never have stopped. Where's the Peters? Where's James and John? Where, where's, where's these men that believed it? They literally became martyrs for what I'm preaching. And right now, we don't have to do that because we got a revelation now. I die myself. I die daily. Paul said, I die daily. That's what he's talking about. I have no opinion. I don't, what is the, what I think about? It doesn't matter what I think about the word. I've had somebody say, what do you think? I don't think about it. I do not give it any thought because if I give it thought, I'll get off into error. I can't afford to get into error. Well, the Bible says this, and that's what it says, and we're going to stay with that. But I can't explain it. I don't understand it. And maybe now we shouldn't need to understand it, but God said it, so let's just do what God said to do. Amen. Power never stops. No power shortage. None of that. I'm trying to find a place to end here, Pastor Bob. <laughs> we should be pressing into the supernatural. Matthew eleven twelve, very quickly. It's a New Living Translation. I don't use this translation often. I'm a King James kind of guy, but this is a good translation. Explains it better. And from the time John the Baptist began preaching, remember, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. No revelation. He had nothing to offer the people, only a baptism. Repent. That was his message. And from the time of John the Baptist began preaching until now, Jesus said in his day, until now, the kingdom of heaven has been for forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. If you think what's happening in Israel right now is about Israel, it's about the church. If you think what's happening right now in our country is about the po politicians, well, we got a deep state problem, let me tell you. God's going to straighten it out. I can go there, but I'm not going there. But I could go there. But let me tell you something else. That is not our problem. Our problem is we are being violently attacked from advancing, from advancing. And the very moment that the church says, okay, We've had enough. COVID, everybody's got it. Listen, people died. I get it. I understand it. People die every day. They do. All kinds of things. But when fear dictates to us what we should be doing, we got to run away from that fear. Get back into faith. Are you all here? So when that happened, that we, we were advancing. This church was advancing, man. It was advancing. It was in, I had two services here, it was blowing out, and my daughter took it. There was, things were happening. All of a sudden, I don't like this, man. I don't like this. I'm going to get you. The only way the devil can destroy you is by fear, nothing else. He has no other arsenal. The Bible calls them darts. Dart never killed anybody. But fear will kill you. And so now, we're in that process now. We're going to rebuild this thing. How are we going to do it? Right from here. Yeah. Word of God. 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 Those who are hungry, word of God. People walk in that back door. I don't know what's going on here, but, man, I need a word from God today. What are you preaching? I'm a, I'm a radical, but I'm going to preach today. I'm here to hear a radical word from God. I believe with all my heart we are at that time right now. Right now. 
Violent people are attacking the church, but the church is advancing, 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 advancing. And even Jesus said, when he talked about the kingdom of darkness, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church unless there's a really an epidemic. No, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Say it with me. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's never going to happen. When the church rises up who they're supposed to be, look out, devil. We're going to rip your stinking head right off. We're going to crush you, put you under our feet where you belong. I don't fear no devil. You don't fear no devil. We're people of God. We're supernatural people. That's why he hates you. He wanted what you've got, and he'll never get it because he's not man. Man can only have this. He can't have it. Angels can't have it. Nobody can have it but man. Man. God created man to have dominion over every single thing, all the works of his hands. We walk in authority and power. We are clothed with the anointing. Stand on your feet real quick. Okay, play this song. Oh, that's right. We don't have anybody up here. I'm calling them in. We need drummer over here that will commit to the work of God. People up here that will commit. Wake up, church. Get your gifts flowing. God needs you. He enlists you into the kingdom. You are in a battle for the soul of mankind. Don't quit now. Get ready for what God's about to do because he'll jump you and pass over you, and you'll go to somebody who can't do it half as good as you, but he'll anoint them to do better than you. I can say these things because I'm not your pastor anymore. But I am your bishop, and the bishop brings a word from God, now word from God. This is a now word from God. This will change your course, your life forever and ever. Don't grow weary. My favorite scripture, do not grow weary while doing good. Because in due season, you will reap if you do not faint. Which means if you faint, you will not reap. Everything I've got, materially, physically, family, everything I've ever had, everything I got from him. There's not a thing I did on my own. Started the first church in a little town called Beloit, Wisconsin, 36,000 people. It was a nothing of a town, nothing of a town. Nobody was there. No Pentecostal church had been built there in 25 years. And the Assembly of God, who was my pastor, was the Assembly of God, he told me that the Assembly of God wrote Ichabod over the door of the city. The glory of the Lord has departed. He looked at me and says, why did, why did you come here? I said, because God told me to. Oh, I guess that's a good reason. We built 45,000 square foot facility there in eight years. Eight years. God packed that place. I mean, I can't tell you what he did. It's just amazing. All God. Everything I've ever got from God, I've got it through him. No talent on my part. No ability on my part. Nothing. I did nothing. Nothing. Except follow him. The best I know how. So I want you to check your heart today. Seriously. Are you playing games with the Lord? I've done that from time to time. I'm like, I'll catch my, well, that's the first song you sang today, the first song you sang, or I guess maybe not the first one. Basically, I'm backslidden, giving up on the Lord. In your heart, you get cold like that. The moment you stop seeing the word as I'm dying to this truth, I, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve any of this. Maybe you're here today and you think, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. 
the anointed one. Preach him and nothing else. If that's you today, there's no monkey business here. This is just the way it is. I, I was in a, a church February 2nd, 1975, third or fourth row back. Preacher said, do you want Christ? And I, I knew I did. I just got out and came down. He didn't say come down. I just got out and came down. I figured the altar is where I need to go. My life was forever changed at that moment. Totally transformed by the power of God. And everything from that moment on I got, I got from him. From him. Nobody else. I owe no man nothing but to love you. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. This is the way that it is. You try to get it any other way, you're a thief. You're a robber. Jesus Christ and him crucified, there's nothing else left. Nothing. Today the church is so confused. The church is so messed up in their thinking. They think the good is, is, is evil, evil is good, and we're accepting all this weird stuff into the body because we want to love everybody and can't be a judge, which about, that's totally ridiculous. We are judges. The Bible says we're judges. Once again, you haven't cracked your Bible. It's in there. I always know that when somebody says, well, we're not supposed to judge people. Really? Where's that at? Oh, I know. You found that judge not that you be not judged. So, therefore, you don't want to be judged. So, I don't want to judge. So, it's all about you then. I'll just leave that hang there for a minute. You want to make this right with God? Come on down here right now. Have the courage to stand in front of me. Come on, right now. What are you waiting for? One more week, one more day, one more hour. What, what do you need? One more thing. Listen, come here. Now. Come on down. God bless you guys. I applaud you. Courage. This is the generation right here, guys. This is the generation right here. Oh, if I could, what's that one that Cher sang? If I could turn back time. Ooh, if I could turn back time, I'd go right back there with what I know now. Oh, my. I would, oh, it would be so good. But my time is coming to a close. These are just starting. This is our job. These are the bones that are rattling. This is the army that is awakening. This is what it's all about. I'm going to wait 60 seconds for you to come. There's somebody else. You need to come on up here. Oh, it's so embarrassing. Really? You haven't read your Bible lately, have you? Of course it's embarrassing. That's it. That's it. Come on. Keep on coming. I want you to take a look who's coming. Look who's coming. Look who's coming. Look at it. Come on. Somebody may say, I, I, thought, I thought they were already Christian. I thought they were already saved. Listen, never, ever, ever just take it for granted somebody knows Jesus. Never. Look at this. These young people want truth. And we'll tell you something else. They recognize a phony up here in the pulpit, and I ain't one. I'm not one. I got too big of a track record. Come on up. You believe this, Pastor Barr? This is the most exciting thing that I've ever seen. This is so great, so awesome. Let me, t let me talk to you guys. I came to Jesus when I was seven years old. I remember distinctly the very moment that I asked him into my heart. I remember it. I had a grandmother, a praying grandmother, Pentecostal as you can get, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. I mean, crazy Pentecostal. And I gave my heart to Jesus at seven years old. At 11 years of age, I had enough awareness about me to walk away from him. And I did my own thing for the next 15 years. 
15 years, I did what I wanted to do. And then one day, I said, enough is enough. And I came back to him. My only regret in my life, my only regret that I have, because I've done everything I know to do when I know to do it. But the only regret I ever have is those wasted 15 years. Where could I have been in Jesus if I just kept just moving one step? I mean, as I was a little kid, yes, but I believe children give their heart to Jesus. They just keep moving forward. You're going to be okay. But you guys, make the decision today. Nobody begged you to come here. You did this on your own. You really did. Pastor Barb, who do we have to stand behind each one of these? Come on up, guys. Stand behind them. Hallelujah. We love this generation. Love this generation. I'm thankful that I can still be part of what God's doing. Father, touch every heart at this altar. No simple prayer is what we're looking for. They've already touched their heart when they began to walk up here. Right now, supernaturally, supernaturally, begin to clothe them with your authority. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, my God. Awesome. 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 After I touch you, I want you to turn around, face the one behind you. Guys, turn around, face the one behind as I pray for you. Okay, hold on a minute. Let me let me touch you. And I want you to turn around. Make sure we got enough people up here. In Jesus' name. You're gonna pray with these people, so get ready to pray with them. You're not gonna be there to catch, you're gonna be there to pray. Right now, make sure they get the goods, okay? Pray for them. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. There you go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There's a very, very strong anointing on this girl. Who is she? Is this your first time here? You've been here before? Do we know you? Oh, wow. There's, um, you got a very strong presence on you, okay? Father, touch her in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory, 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 glory. Yes. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the Lord. Jesus' name. Kalaba Brodisapada. Jesus' name. Come here, young man. Step forward. Right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, God is so good. He really, really is. He's good, 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 good. There's nobody gooder than God. God loves this generation, man. This generation has seen everything, done everything, and they're so distracted from what the truth. But they're hungry for reality. Jesus is going to do this thing big time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us all to repeat something that God gave me for you as soon as I can find it. Here we are. While they're praying up here, I want you to repeat this after me, if you will. Say, we stand at the door. Where all things are possible. And by faith, we press forward in prayer. 
asking in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the manifestation of the supernatural power of God to be seen in us, through us, and around us. Give the Lord a big shout. Amen.